Okay, so I'm just going to start presenting this. So this is my uh, synthesis on what we've gone over in the first unit of our dyslexia course. Uh, this first slide here, uh, I think that the first thing, well, the main thing that it tackles throughout all of this, which is probably why the unit's named so aptly, is the definition of dyslexia, which I was actually kind of excited to find out what the definition of dyslexia was or is. And it's, let me get this off the screen. And it's, uh, it's pretty, there are definitions that it gives. Uh, the thing by, let's see, it's not, oh, but by, by Odegaard, yes, the little five page one. Uh, they talk about, they, they have a sort of paragraph definition, but like Gregorico explains, which is someone that uh, Hanan has actually referenced directly in the book references directly, is that these definitions tend to be very broad, very generalized. Uh, that was something that I saw throughout. And because it's so broad, it goes into quite a bit on the history of the definition. Uh, I kind of have that in this little meme here. You have a little evolution of how uh, defining dyslexia has sort of evolved. And I thought that the thing to end on would have made uh, Hanan proud in that the final evolution is to just abandon the term uh, for more uh, inclusionary broad terms, ones that don't also carry the weight uh, that dyslexia carries, of course. But uh, over here you have the quotes that sort of deal with the complexity. Uh, that's the crux of this slide is how complex and broad the definition of dyslexia is, which is covered very well uh, by this first quote, defining dyslexia is seemingly both very easy and very difficult because it's easy to have a broad definition that, you know, it's a, of what kind of difficulty with reading it is and what even more specifically that pertains to, but trying to differentiate exactly who or what, who is dyslexic, what is dyslexia most specifically uh, is something that we still haven't been able to reach. So there's no convenient means by which they may be detected in individuals. Uh, there's no easy way um, to try to do that. And that enterprise is flawed, as Hanan says. So that's what I saw sort of connecting all of these is just going over the broadness and complexity of how dyslexia is defined. And that sort of bleeds into everything else that um, the larger works like the book discuss uh, and how that involves everything and how that involves how the research is performed, uh, the goals of the research, uh, the goals of how we respond to people that we think are dyslexic, how we identify them. It, you know, the definition is actually very important. So uh, then I thought, you know, if we don't know what the definition is, if there's so much blur going on, then what do we know? And a lot of this mainly comes from the book uh, that Elliot and Gregorico wrote. Uh, that is the bulk of what we digested this week, after all. But let's look at these quotes. It says, profiling on the basis of IQ subtests is now generally agreed to be of little diagnostic value for identifying dyslexic children. So uh, despite some of the resistance from facilities from uh, mainly I remember from researchers that still go off of uh, differentiating with IQ tests. Um, I, I was pretty convinced from Gregorinko's work, Ellen and Gregorinko's work that uh, IQ tests are something that we shouldn't quite take into consideration. I believe there was a statistic about one to 3% difference in how there uh, there is actually a usable difference, but by and large, that's not what you should be using to try to place children in the dyslexic category specifically, or to say that this child, uh, is his IQ is too low. I believe the main problem was that this child has too low of an IQ uh, to be considered dyslexic. They're just 
uh, you know, impaired in some way. There were other terms for it. That's why I have this little meme over here. You know, I am now of the camp that IQ tests don't help to identify dyslexia in children by and large. Uh, and then these all chain into what the next slide sort of has as a response. But uh, other things that we do know is that there's not really an agreed upon model for RTI. Uh, it's It has poor longitudinal stability. Other critiques of it were that it was just guesswork. Uh, so their RTI is an alternative and it's not so disproven as IQ tests. And it actually does get the ball rolling with responding, which I'll get into, but it has its issues just to be acknowledged. Um, there's no definition that we've agreed upon, uh, as you saw on the last slide. However, we cannot forget how the issues of dyslexia remain and that it is, it is still something within, uh, more general, the more general umbrella of just learning disabilities. So it is a still a more, more specific learning disability and that, uh, Odegaard, I thought this was very, you know, as a teacher, and this is what I'll get into, uh, a very good quote from from them that we must respond with appropriate levels of intensity. And this is a more specifically in reference to that continuum uh, that it that dyslexia is on a continuum on sort of a spectrum, uh, which Elliot and Grigorenko also reference. Uh, that to respond to that spectrum, we must have appropriate levels of intensity. So this is my response to everything. And you know what, I'll start with this meme. Uh, you know, I just, I can't help but to think of myself as a teacher. And there were several points in the readings that, uh, especially in, Gregor in Gregorinko's work, that reference what teachers would rather do and what they prefer. And uh, it really kept things real with the lack of resources, which usually limits uh, what all students that were able to help uh, we would, you know, in a perfect world, a stu you know, every student, regardless of whether they had a disability or a learning difficulty or what have you, every student would be able to get advanced individual attention. But we know that uh, because of a lack of resources, we tend to just reserve that for students that are struggling more. Uh, but at the very least, we would hope that every struggling student could get that individual attention. And it really just struck home. Uh, how part of the conversation is that lack of resources there, which, as you can see, can at times prevent us from helping every struggling reader. So these quotes deal largely with that. Teachers want a broader definition to allow themselves, ourselves, I feel, discretion in providing services for children with generic school learning problems, uh, comparing reading ability to certain demarcations below what's considered normal, creates a wait to fail model. And this is also mentioned uh, by Ali and Gregorico. Um, I don't know if they were, if when they don't say who they reference here when they put this in quotes, maybe it was just a general quote usage, just, you know, that this is a term, but they say use of RTI, which is, which is the alternative responsive model uh, as an alternative means a wait to fail scenario can be avoided. And I think that's what makes it best if we're still working to research all of this to have a proper definition uh a more operational definition if we're still figuring things out with dyslexia the least we can do is respond uh with what we do know now uh that doesn't mean that you know part of the criticism is that it's a guessing game but what else can you do what else can you do than to, than to guess and try to go off of what you think the child needs and what attention, what extra attention you think they need. Uh, and Odegaard talks a little more on this wait to fail model, how it, it, it it's discussing how you can only truly know if a student has this uh, as opposed to, oh, you know, that's just your average student struggling to learn to read, you know, every second grader, third grader has some struggle with that, your average third grader. Uh, but waiting for that third grader, third grader to uh, not have crossed that stepping point by the end of third grade, by then that's too late. You should have already uh, had intervention with them and additional support for them. 
So I think that using RTI and at least responding to any struggling reader and then seeing what level of response that needs, you know, levels one through three or the waves as they refer to them in the UK, I think that's a much better solution than to be more accurate, but too late. So that is my response to all this that, uh, you know, as much as there is taken into account all the things discussed in the book, like uh, how males tend to struggle more than females, all, all these little divergences that it takes in the history. I think the biggest takeaways and which were also the most common points that cross throughout the uh, each of the works is that we're having, we still struggle knowing exactly what this is, exactly how to identify it. But the most that we can do right now is at least respond to the ones, the, the students that are struggling. So that is my slide. Thank you. Uh, and I'll try work to end this recording.